Um, so our panelists today are Zoe Howard, uh, Terry Lee Dixon, Catherine Harmer, and Catherine Montagu. Um, and we'll start off with them. Uh, if you could please give an overview of your career. Uh, if you could talk about how did you get into ballet stage and stage management, as well as how long have you been in this current part of your career? That would be great. Uh, do we have any, uh, Terry, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, sure, by all means. Um, hello all, uh, can't quite see you, but never mind. Um, I've been doing this for rather a long time. Um, over the decades, uh, um, I've moved in and out of working with dance, a um, couple of years with the Royal Ballet, a um, couple of years with the new group, um, three years with New London Ballet, three um, with uh, Ballet International based in uh, London, but actually working mostly worldwide. Um, uh, the occasional foray over to Netherlands Dance Theatre um, and... Uh, Oh, there must be some more in there. Oh, yes, uh, about three years working with Margot Fontaine, looking after her on uh, as technical director for all of her uh, gala concerts, which were worldwide and were known in those days as Fontaine's Follies. Um, so, yes, uh, how long have I, how did I get into it? Um, Sheer chance, really, you know, to be honest. I mean, one always had an interest. Um, uh, I remember, I mean, this, Watching dance, at, uh, particularly one particular thing I remember is the the, uh, the visit of New York City Ballet to the Opera House in 65, 66. Um, uh, it's uh, because uh, there was a why in the back of my head as a young man. I'm not going to be long, by the way. Um, as a, hey, this is a form of theatre that uh, is truly international. We can go do this anywhere. Uh, there are no language barriers in sense of understanding from the audience. So there you go. There's a bit of background. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Harmer, would you like to go next? Okay. Hi, I'm Kat. Um, I studied English and Theatre Studies at university and then I did my first two uh, pantos and a, an opera before I went, or, um, while I was a student, and then I went and did uh, my postgrad in stage management at Mount View a very long time ago. I've been stage managing for approximately 22 years, give or take. Um, how I got into it, I dance specifically. I did, I, I was at home with a small baby and a friend of mine, um, took a job as production manager for Phoenix Dance Theatre, who were local to me, and offered me a job saying, I need casual ASMs, come work for me. Um, so I went, yes, please, thank you very much. So again, pure luck. And I then went off and did other things, um, spent five years teaching and came back after that Going, kind of, going, I want to come back and work in theatre again. And the first company that wanted to employ me was Cloud Dance Festival because of having worked at Phoenix. Um, so I spent five years with Cloud Dance Festival, starting out as an ASM, ending up as a stage manager. Um, I also did six years as the stage manager for Red Cross UK dance event, Dance Make Your Move, which was a national dance competition. So that's me. Thank you. Um, Catherine Montague, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, hi. Um, I studied um, stage management at Central School of Speech and Drama, uh, then left and did a summer season at Southwold. Uh, while I was there, the ASM's job came up at Northern Ballet Theatre, which is what they were called then, they're now called. Um, <laughs> so I went and um, I did my interview and I got the job and then I worked for them as ASM, DSM and then stage manager. Um, after I worked for them, I then moved to Romba, so going from ballet to contemporary dance. Um, and having worked for Romba, I then worked for Phoenix um, back again in Leeds. Um, 
and that's my dance career. I then moved into theatre. Um, I have to say, prefer dance. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, and then having done that, I moved into uh, events. Um, and after that, I moved into education, which is where I am now. So I am currently senior stage management lecturer uh, at Basketball University. That's me. Thank you. And Zoe? Hello. Um, so I, I did a, an English literature degree and then trained in stage management at Guildford School of Acting. Um, and then spent some years working in opera, mainly. Um, and uh, I joined Scottish Ballet as DSM eight years ago, and that was my first job in, in ballet or dance. Um, in all honesty, what brought me into ballet was the lure of a permanent contract. <laughs> um, um, so I spent six years as DSM and then became the stage manager here uh, two years ago. And that's me. Thank you so much. Uh, Jack, would you like to get on with the questions. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much for the introductions and thanks as well sort of for giving up your evening to come on and chat to us. Um, I know that we're all probably on lots of Zooms in the day anyway, so it's nice of you to come on in the evening and help us out as well. Um, so if we just get sort of straight into the first round of questions, if any of the panellists want to feel free to answer. Uh, so the first question we got is, what specialised skills slash qualities do you recommend for working in ballet and dance? Um, and again, open that up to the floor, anyone can answer. First aid. When I when I first started working in dance, you couldn't get any company to employ you unless you were a qualified first aider. Um, it's the most useful thing. I mean, I I don't know if that's the same now. It may have changed, but you couldn't get employed um, in stage management if you weren't a, a first aider, especially for dance, because dancers are very clumsy. It, it, it's always amazed me how people who can be so controlled and graceful and beautiful on stage will then run off stage into the wings and run straight into a wall because they haven't noticed that the wall that's been there all day is still there and in the way. And they will just run into walls or fall down steps that they've walked up and down 20 times. You're always needing first aid. That's the biggest thing. Shall I have a go? I want to pick up on that and say, yeah, if you're going to do a first aid qual, let's make sure it's a proper one, not the one day. Mm. Three day course, absolute, absolute minimum. Yes. While you're doing that, there are plenty of organisations that will now provide you with basic training in mental health first aiding as well. And that's becoming more interesting as things go by. Um, my suggestion for what special skills do you need? Eyes in the back of your head. <laughs> it's as simple as that. An all round awareness. Um, when you start in dance, it is incredible incredibly uh, confusing what's going on around you um, and so that's one thing I would really suggest is very good I mean everybody will say oh you need to be very good uh, oh you need to know the names of the steps you don't oh you need to be half of a choreographer and half of this that and the other no you don't you know what you need is a general relaxed um, ambiance around you so people will come to you with problems with problem solving um, you need good relationships they're probably most important you need to be aware what is going on around you 360 degrees every minute of the day that's my thought shall I have a go? Oh, no, you go Catherine you go that's fine um, I was going to say two things learn how to lay a dance floor properly and also make sure you put clear dance uh, tape over any spike marks you put down on the floor because yep. dancers will kick them off with glee. <laughs> so yeah, those are two things I would suggest. Um, I think the things for me, I think it depends a little bit on um, what, what form of dance you're working in. Um, if you're looking at working in one of the um, larger ballet companies, um, 
which might be, you know, if you're walking in contemporary dance, you might be working with this quite a small company, but for a company like ours, I, you know, if I'm employing an ASM, I would definitely look for some confidence in managing large groups. You know, we're, we're a company of 37 dancers and actually we're not that big by ballet company standards. So um, uh, there's, a, you know, even at ASM level, there's quite a lot of um, pressure on um, managing all those people at once, managing all those people in a wing in performance. Um, a lot of flexibility. Um, again, another feature of the, the sort of standing ballet companies is that, uh, and quite an, an unusual thing amongst theatre companies now, is that we have a, a permanent company of artists which means that they need to be occupied at all times of year. And that means that we flick between all kinds of different repertoire across, um, across the course of a year. So um, uh, after Easter, we're gonna be probably working on some repertoire that won't be performed, you know, God willing and all that, um, until next year, you know, even if ever, <laughs> everything goes to plan. Um, so quite a flexible mentality, I'd say, ability, you know, you're not going to be working on one production um, and seeing it through and then going on to the next like you might in some theatre forms. Um, and I won't spend too long on this because I know it's coming in one of the following questions, but um, school reading is quite a big thing for us. Brilliant. Is that everyone's, all of the panellists thoughts on that question? Are you happy for us to move on? Yeah, so the next question is a two-parter. Um, I'll probably direct it at Zoe, as I know that she's currently doing some rehearsals. Um, so it's, what does a day in your life look like? And the first part of the question is in the rehearsal period. And then the second part is in the performance period. Um, so I'll actually kind of avoid talking about what's happening at the moment, because we're obviously in a very weird situation um operating a, a bubble system to to work around covid um which is we're very fortunate to be working at all um so it's probably more useful to talk about what happens in normal times and what we hope will be going back to at some point so during rehearsal the main thing is a, a dancer's day always starts with a class company class so that is um for us usually um between an hour and an hour and a half uh, and it starts for them at the bar, um, uh, doing more basic warm-up exercise, I suppose, and they gradually move into the centre of the room, doing stuff that looks a bit more impressive and acrobatic. Um, so that's that's a fundamental feature of uh, a ballet or dance company's day. Um, so when we're in rehearsal, we will start a day with a company class, and there will always be one member of stage management, at least on duty, to cover that for first aid reasons, um, you know, studio management reasons. Um, and then we we go into a rehearsal day that would usually run uh, a morning session of um, sort of half 11 till two and then an after afternoon session of three till half six. So it's a longish day. Um, here we're managing um, three rehearsal studios um, and we are a permanent team of just two. So you can do the maths there that it's, um, you know, we, we, we're skipping between the studios a, a lot and there is not always stage management cover in every studio. Um, when we're performing, um, depends a little bit on the, on the particular tour, but on our, for example, our Christmas tours, which are quite busy, uh, where we'll be doing eight shows a week. Um, again, you do class first thing in the day. If it's a two show day, that's relatively early in the morning. Um, and then a, a matinee and an evening show. Um, if it's um, a blissful one show day, then we might get a bit of a lie in and uh, do class in the afternoon. Those days we'd also, we'd also have um, ongoing rehearsals on tour, um, both to keep um, that, that tour's repertoire going, bringing other casts in. That's a feature of a ballet company that you, you know, on our Christmas shows, we might have as many or as seven casts of principals across the tour and you have to keep rehearsing new people in. Uh, and also we will start rehearsing repertoire for the next season while we're on tour. Um, so those, those long tours can be quite full on. Brilliant, thank you. Is there anyone else from the panel that wants to touch a bit more on that? 
Can I suggest it might be helpful for Zoe if she was to describe the actual structure of the company, not in terms of the dancers, but you know, uh, do you have you know, do you have a, a house physio? Do you have a chiropractor? Do you have a, you know any any of those any of those things? What's what's the situation with your company? Uh, yes, and I think I, that is a side of things that is tending to grow. I think in ballet and dance, so we. We have um, a head of a head of performance medicine who is a physiotherapist by um, by uh, trade, um, along with another member of permanent staff who is a um, chiropractor and massage therapist. And then we have some other vi visiting medical staff. Um, there's um, something called gyrotonics that I, in all honesty, still don't understand entirely after eight years. Um, but it's about using specialist equipment. Um, to assist them with um, fitness um, and body toning and so on. Uh, we have a dedicated gym on the premises to allow them to keep their fitness up. Um, and then in terms of other sort of staff structure that's directly around the dancers, um, the artistic staff is a big part of that. So most of our choreographers will be um, visiting um, creatives. Um, but then we have a... Um, what we call the ballet staff who are the people who teach company class and also teach repertoire once it's been created so that might be while a show is, a new show is being created they will take start teaching it to other casts or it might be when we're reviving a previous show that they will um it doesn't require the choreographer to come back they will just teach the repertoire to the dancers that are there at that time um, we also have permanent music staff, um, so we have to have a company pianist who plays for class and uh, also for, for any rehearsals that are done to the sort of classical repertoire that would be performed with an orchestra. Um, and um, we have a principal conductor who actually lives in Canada, so we haven't seen him this year. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and Is that have... Bram? Uh, no, it's uh, uh, Jean-Claude Picard. Oh, I thought, I thought, I thought Brand Tovey had reappeared or something. There you no, go. No, no, it's, uh, he's, he's a younger conductor. And then we'd have guest, <laughs> guest conductors joining him on tour because um, you'll never get a conductor to do eight shows a week. Um, mm. Yeah, so I think those are the sort of essential roles that surround the Super. dancers. Yeah. OK, could I take a moment here to actually point out how that has changed a lot over the time I've been doing this silliness? Um, if, if you wanted a comparison... Uh, what used to be called the new, the, the Royal Ballet Touring Group, which is the, the outfit that eventually became the Saddle Shores Royal Ballet and then moved to Birmingham, became the Birmingham Royal Ballet. Um, when I went, first toured with them, I, at that time I was being um, uh, sort of additional ASM brackets, uh, multi multimedia, we'd call it these days. It was slides, cinema projections and, and strange sound in those days. Um, we had a stage manager. Um, and an ASM, and a touring carpenter, and two electricians, and a ballet master, and a company manager, uh, and that was it. That was the entire staff on the road. Uh, now, they've all moved on to interesting things. You know, the, uh, the ballet master was, was Peter Wright, for example, um, who's it's kind of like famously now a, a very old and much revered choreographer. The point I was about to make is if you look at the, the listing for the number of bodies that are out working in support of the company, which is what it's for, in support of the programs. Sorry about the dog in the background. Um, you're going to find numbers in excess of 20 or 30 doing that. Um, things have changed enormously. Other differences, you may, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to hijack this, but you were talking about um, catatonics, was it? Uh, gyrotonics or whatever. 40 years ago, no one in their right mind carried uh, gym equipment in the back of the truck. Um, you know, you, it just didn't happen. And one of the outcomes of that is the huge number of injuries and early retirements. One of my bosses years ago was a guy called Alexander Grant, Alex Grant, quite a well-known uh, character dancer um, from the Royal Ballet from years ago, who quit at the age of 34 because his back was entirely stuffed. Um, no one developed... Uh, precautionary routines uh, of, of 
formalized exercise. It wasn't scheduled into the programming either. Right, I've had a rant. Time for someone else to go. Catherine Harwa, I was wondering if you wanted to touch a bit on the day in the life of sort of how a dance show or a dance production might work. Okay, so when um, when I was with CDF, um, Cloud Dance Festival, we used to run a, four, a three or four day festival um, three or four times a year um, in assorted venues in London. Um, we never actually ever managed to find a proper home for the company. Um, we used to have approximately 25 individual performing companies um, performing per festival and each, com um, each company will perform twice over the three nights that the festival ran. So day one you'd have 10 companies, day two you'd have 10 companies, day three you'd have 10 companies made up of people who had, hadn't performed on one of the previous nights. Um, we worked a four day week with a day for rigging, focusing, doing lighting, doing sound, anything technical that was required, AV and so on, um, setting up the setting up another new venue, um, dressing rooms, laying dance floor, and all the rest of that. And then days two and days two and three were largely take your first 10, take your 10 companies, one after the other. They'd get about 45 minutes or so on stage. Um, text them, move them on, and then you'd get a short break, and then you'd be you literally have short breaks, turn around, get everything sorted, and then you were into performance. Um, the fourth day would be um, you'd get we actually get a lie in on the fourth day, and not have to be there till the afternoon because every in principle every company had teched. Um, occasionally we'd get companies who would not have performed for two nights so they'd come in and go can we have an hour to just rehearse so yes of course you can come in at this time but that means you've got to come in and be in the building while they rehearse um then do a show show in the show in the evening and then get out after that um mostly the, big, the biggest job for the in and the out is a combination of lighting and dance floor. And as Catherine said, learn to lay dance floor properly and quickly, preferably. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm, for me, and I'm sure for everyone else on the call as well, it's good to hear a different perspective from dance mm. and ballet and sort of the differences within it. If everyone's happy, we'll move on to the yeah. next question, which is advice for stage managers who don't know how to score read. Um, and then sort of as a side on to that, how did you then learn how to do it? I'm happy to. Uh, yeah. um, so I could read music. Um, uh, I have a musician for other. Um, so I had a lot of uh, music. Um, as a child and played the cello and the piano and therefore uh, I can score read. Um, I did have, uh, when we were at Northern, um, I had an ASM who could not score read um, and, but was absolutely determined to learn one of the shows, um, which I was thinking, no, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> but she was determined and she learned how to basically count the dots and she was she was musical she was very musical um and it took me quite a long time because i can read music to have the trust in her but she absolutely proved she could do it and she did cue uh one of uh we were doing a triple bill and she cued one of the pieces in the triple bill uh she then went on to open two of the biggest West End shows as a DSM on musicals. Um, so, you know, it is possible and it can be done. I have to say though, if you're going to go for ballet particularly, you will be given, even as an ASM, um, a score reading test. Um, I think Zoe might 
probably say that is that the case up at Scottish? Um, we t- because our ASMs are seasonal, um, we don't do it as a matter of course. Um, so it would only be really if we were anticipating putting them on book cover that we might look to do okay. that. Yeah. Okay. I think Terry wants to um, Yes, I'm going to throw in a few comments here. First, um, how did I learn to read a score? Well, basically, um, I, I had music lessons at school. I played violin and other stuff. And, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, is it essential? Absolutely not. You can do it another way. You can do it different ways. Uh, my good friend, Chris Rooney, uh, who's been in and out of dance for the entire, for, for years and years and years and years. Um, can't, can't read dots for, for, for his life. Um, there are times when in fact, it's not practical. Uh, if you, you try following um, the score for field figures. Uh, it looks like it looks like musical notation for the first three pages. Then it turns into something that really resembles, you know, a, a demented spider running across the page. It is not essential. Um, Zoe and I probably have a row about this later. You get there are ways of dealing with it. Half of the of, of the dance productions I've been involved with, I don't need a whole score. I can use it, but I don't need it. Okay. To answer the questions. Uh, if you don't know how to score it, you want to learn how, do Andrew Killian's course. It's mm-hmm. that simple, the, the two-stage course. Andrew, of course, is the guy who used to, don't know if he still does, but used to set the, uh, the, the, the score skills test for opera and dance, mostly opera. Um, in my, from my point of view, opera is that much tougher. The reason being that normally you're working from a vocal score uh, where the instrumental chunks um, aren't terribly well. You end up having to annotate it musically as well as the stage manager. But yeah, that's fine. You know, I mean, you don't really need, but if you do want to, uh, or if you go, if, if you want to join a company who is insisting on that level of skill, then go do Andrew Killian's course. It's the best in the world. Um, and also I'd just like to put forward, um, for a lot of contemporary dance, they may not have a score, they may not be the music. Um, so for a lot of contemporary dance, you are taking your cues from either knowing the dance, knowing um, where things are happening. Um, and, you know, what I would say is, you know, when you're a stage manager on dance, the most important thing is knowing, knowing where the dancers are on the stage in order that you can tell lighting, the lighting designer, they will be here, they will be there. This is where the, the couple, the main couple are. This is where your principal dancers are. Um, and also knowing if they're in a lift or not, um, because there's that height that you need to get to um, on the lighting if they're in a lift. So those are the important bits. Um, and and yes, you know, there are, there are many ways that you can cue uh, and you don't have to always read the music. Absolutely agree. Um, again, the one I was the example I was using, you know, none of us actually could have anything to do with the dots. Um, and we're three, there was a committee of stage managers trying to call that one. Um, and in the end, we actually basically most of it came from little little matchstick man drawings, you know, and notes like, you know, five in a heap upstage right electrics nine you know i mean that's the kind of thing on a piece of card i expect those cards are still in the files at the opera house who knows you know but no it's it, it could be very problematic um if you're working with uh, if you're not working with live music which you know in some instances you can't because some of it just plain ain't playable um I mean, famously squeaky door, a piece, you know, done by uh, Maurice Beja for Mena Gilgood years ago, which is still in the repertoire all over the place. Um, you know, there just is no way. You can't do it from a stopwatch. But, you know, um, uh, if you've got skill with QLab, that's worth developing. You know, so there we go. I think most of the colleges teach QLab these days. Damn handy bit of electronics, that is. I've said enough for now. Um, I guess I just I, I would um, reiterate what what Catherine just said about I mean probably about we we're, uh, although we're a ballet company we're quite split really between classical ballet and contemporary and actually probably as much as half of the show calling that I've done with the company has not been of the kind of music that has a, a, a score um, and similarly uh, to what Terry said that there are sometimes classical scores that are 
so, for, so sometimes, for example, you have a choice between using only a full orchestral score and no score at all. There is one piece where I do have to call off a full orchestral score. It's hell on earth. Um, <laughs> but there is there is simply no other alternative it's, to do that. Um, it's, it's too many pages. You're turning all the time with an orchestra. Believe me, in that case, there's no you, you need a score. There's no alternative. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so there, it is very common to call, call from you know uh, notes and visual cues and so on because there's simply no no score at all um i would just i would caution i mean i would i would absolutely reiterate that you know if, if you have any option of a course available um whether that be the andrew killian course or something in your um your drama school training uh, grab it with both hands um i absolutely think it is possible to learn very well as a score reader without a musical background my uh, my when i was a, a baby asm <laughs> with my first job my first dsm is still one of the best show callers i've ever known and she had learned th you know in, through that sort of academic route to never play the musical instrument and she was fabulous at it so don't be intimidated and remember people talk about score reading remember that the what you need to do when you're um, calling a show is actually score following um you know you don't need to know what the the note names of the notes are or what the note values are you you're following patterns and um following counts so don't get intimidated by it i would just caution that if you were applying for a job with me and i think this would probably go for any of the uk ballet companies at the moment you're not going to get a look in if you can't score read is, is the honest truth of it um it's, um, you know, there is enough of our, certainly, possibly not, not ASM level, sorry, I should say, unless we particularly wanted you to do book cover, but if you're applying uh, at DSM or stage manager level, um, it's, you, you're going to have a lot of competition who can score read. And honestly, why would I take on the added pressure of having someone in the corner who can't score read when I got the option of someone in the corner who can it's, I, I, that's a little bit blunt, but I think that's a realistic depiction of how um, most ballet companies, at least, are going to employ in, in, in the current situation. Can I throw in a little little addendum to that? And I absolutely agree with Zoe. You know, I mean, if you're looking at getting yourself hired, follow her advice, absolutely. Um, um, fake it for the time being. Uh, but the, the other element of this is not just being able to follow the dots. It's also knowing the repertoire. It's about getting to know the repertoire. Um, that's and that you build up. It, it sort of it it, it it creeps in. You know, sort of finds its way into your spirit. Uh, and there were as already mentioned. You know, I mean, uh, Catherine was saying, well, you know, you need to be able to brief the lighting designer on where they're going to be and who's in a lift and who's not and you know all those things are important but it's getting to know it's actually it's actually attending rehearsals when you actually have no real immediate function but you get to know and you could sit with i mean if you wanted you could sit with a rehearsal pianist and um you know, uh, there go. and if you have any trouble following a particular bit, there's a music staff that's employed to help you. You know, it's as simple as that. So, you know, yes, absolutely agree with Zoe. Uh, but that's reading the dots, following the dots, counting the bars is not the whole thing. It's knowing the show as well, as it is with, you know, as any DSM will tell you. Um, but there is a caution as well, and I'll try not to go on too long. And that's, that's score following tunnel vision. And I see it happening all over the place in dance, in opera or whatever. You've got someone calling the show who's got their head into the dots, their fingers are poised on the cue lights or the you know, trigger or whatever, and they have no idea what's going on stage. Uh, and, uh, it's incredible how often that happens. So that's a little caution. As I, was, as I said at the beginning, be aware 360 degrees, you know, what's going on around you. Right, I've said enough for the time being, I think. Brilliant. If everyone's added everything they want to for that one, we can move on to the next question. So the next one is, how do you tackle difficult situations slash things going wrong during touring shows? Again, anyone's welcome to lead on this one. Uh, 
That's a pretty tough one. I mean, you know, it's 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 it's, it's because it, it, each difficult situation is going to have its own inappropriate um, solution. Uh, how do you tackle difficult situations? By cooperating with other people. By if it's to do with a if if there's a, a dancer that's feeling bad or whatever, you speak with the ballet master. You speak with you know the, 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 one of the wardrobe team who might give you some information. You speak to the dancer themselves. Uh, if there's a technical problem in you know if if there's something that's going to go in the show report, if it's not a clean show, you need to communicate with the head of the appropriate department. I mean, so you know each of these things that that was says things going wrong during during the, well you know i mean you, you deal with it on the basis of the actual problem there's no one off answer but a, apart from collaboration with the rest of the team yes um, learn to work collaboratively because it will save you tons and tons of work on your own if you do you know it took me a few years to realize that when you're right, when you're DSMing a show and you're writing a show report, you don't actually have to know everything, all the details of everything that went wrong and what got done about it. What you need to do is make a note of whatever went wrong. Go find the technician, go find the flyman, go find the sound guy, whoever. Go and ask them because they know better than you what went wrong. They know what they did to fix it. And if you need to, if it's something really technical and you have no idea what they're saying, you just you can just say to them, tell me what I need to write on the show report. And they'll give you the five word thing that you need to write down that tells the producer, this was a problem. We fixed it like this, all taken care of, moving on. Um, you know, learning to work collaboratively with people saves you so much work in the long run. That said, um, the when we did Dance Make Your Move, um, which we had groups of kids, up to 30 kids in a group, and we had groups of kids up um, as young as four or all the way up to 18. Um, our biggest, as a general rule, our biggest fear of things going wrong was kids falling off the stage, you know, kids getting distracted and either falling off the stage because they weren't familiar with the space or if especially if they were small just kind of getting distracted by oh I can see my mum in the audience and walking off the edge yeah pick pick your pick your worst case scenario um never happened because we mitigated for that we allowed them every 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 new group that ever came up to the stage we allowed them five minutes of wandering around the stage you take them around and go okay so this is the stage this is the thing you don't go near that you don't touch it you don't look at it it doesn't exist you you're not allowed there this is the bit that this is for you this is your bit here and you give them five minutes of running around going oh my god it's really exciting being on stage in a theater because you know the adults who come in as adults later on and they're all cool about it and they kind of wander around going oh yes what a wonderful nice space this is yesterday they were small children running around going oh my god it's so exciting here so you and just kind of allow you know we factor in time to allow them to come onto the stage and be excited and then go right now you listen and you don't go over there you don't touch those things so we didn't ever have incidents with the children on the stage. The one thing we ever had incidents with, and this happened pretty much every event we did, stage invasions by overexcited parents watching their kids win a heat. Going, oh my God, I must get up onto the stage at once to take my photo with my child. It's like, no, you could do that later. You could do that in 10 minutes time when we've got rid of all of the other children off the stage. No, 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 I must get on stage and take a photo now. No, you really mustn't. And sometimes there was no alternative but to go out and stand on the stage at the top of the stairs and just stand there like bouncers and go, I'm sorry, madam, no, you can't get on stage. 
and they would constantly argue, but you just have to be polite and firm. And one rule for everybody, because if you let one parent up going, yeah, okay, then you have to let them all up. To treat everybody the same, always. Oh, have you got anything else to add for that one? Um, just very quickly that um, obviously within dance, if you have one dancer go off injured, um, it can mean a complete cast change, um, which also means that, you know, and, and the people you go to first are wardrobe, are costume, because it is a massive, massive turnaround for them. And you have to make decisions very, very quickly about who, which casts are going on, who's moving into which role. Um, so, and and one one dancer going off from from a couple of principal dancers um, means that that couple's now out, and now you're going down to your second cast, your third cast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's just it's just a big change. Um, which, you know, and yes, down to the collaboration. You also may have to do some very quick placing calls, um, just making sure that everybody, you know, if you're moving corps de ballet around that you need to get, um, you know, normally there are six dancers on and you're down to four dancers or there are eight dancers. And, you know, it's just getting them placed on the stage to make it look good um, and to keep it looking as, as, as good as it possibly can be, um, but yeah. I think a little word of caution here is that to say that, by the way, not everything can be fixed. Some, you know, things will go wrong. They just do. It's in the nature of the beast, particularly if the schedules are bad. Um, if you're opening a new program somewhere, maybe it's a triple bill, maybe it's a full length piece. It could be a white belly. It could be, a, you know, a three or four things or a whole long piece of contemporary. Um, typically, you will find that uh, you as a member of the stage manager will be working the longest hours in the building, uh, possibly possibly a little bit longer than water, possibly not, probably either way. Uh, and um, the rest of the, the technical departments will have been working long hours too. We've done three of three sessions of technical prep. Uh, it's really a bit chancy to expect a totally clean show on the first performance. We all try to do it, of course, and, you know, wouldn't ever, wouldn't ever want to be in a position where, you know, one wasn't trying that hard, but things will go wrong and they will need fixing. Can't be fixed. You can't, you, you can't turn the clock back and fix an error. Um, you can try to avoid things by having clarity, um, but, uh, you know, things will go wrong. It's, it's in the nature of the beast. It's called live performance. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then if we move on to the next question, and Zoe, if you could start us off, that would be great. It's, what are the roles of the ASM within ballet and dance? Um, so very similar to a lot of other theatre forms, really. Um, uh, it, within our company, the, the ASM role tends to be very props focused. We tend to be employing an ASM on the um, bigger narrative ballets that will have a lot of props. Um, I will hold up my hands and say I am a fairly awful props maker. Um, so, um, you know, I, I generally look for an ASM who has some props making skills and that will be um, uh, quite a major focus for them once we're out on tour, be um, setting and maintaining the props. Um, so obviously, yeah, that's pretty similar to, <laughs> you know, a lot of what you'll be trained to do at, at drama school. Um, as I touched on previously, um, there's a lot of people management. Um, the ASM will have sole responsibility for um, dozens of dancers on one side of the stage. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of people management going on, um, potentially book cover, depending on the nature of the show and our other staffing. Um, and then just generally assisting with those department de departmental duties that are specific to ballet stage management. So doing the class cover, um, managing those um, extra rehearsals on tour and um, probably worth mentioning that in order to for us not to work completely unmanageable hours right the way through the tour um, some of those things would be just staffed by one member of stage management so the ASM is some, sometimes on their own for that so there's a degree of autonomy that's expected 
um, from an ASM um, when they're working from us, uh, working for us rather. Um, yeah, so we just, just require that little bit of maturity and confidence from them, that they're happy working with um, with with their their seniors on the end of a phone at all times, but just not not always there with them. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Catherine Harmer, do you want to touch a bit on what they're like in sort of a dance setting? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, it, at Cloud Dance Festival, we used to require RA sense to be a bit, to do a lot of the technical stuff. So you'd be doing sound. I, I once lost a, an ASM to sound for an entire festival because one company on the first day had specific requirements. And he was gone and he didn't come back for days. Um, I didn't see him again till the get out. Um, lighting, um, you're always, um, always needed for helping with rigging, focusing, moving ladders. Um, again, all of the good jobs like laying dance floor and um, spiking and so on. Um, in performance, one of the big things that we require for our on-stage ASMs um, is basically a stage LX type job um, is regelling side booms between pieces because your pieces will have different require lighting requirements. You've got a set of side booms in each wing. A lighting designer will just come up and hand you some gel and go, right, Here's the list. These are where this is where they go, and you've got them in their gel frames on the floor at the foot of the boom. You need to know how to regel quickly and silently in the dark, at the same time as making sure you've got enough time to finish your scene change. It's not it, it's not particularly complicated and we've always had enough ASMs to cover all contingencies. If that means one person on each side is doing lighting things and one person on each side or two people are coming on, um, coming on to do scene changes, whatever works best for a particular piece or for a particular evening, it's all good. But there's a lot of little bits of technical things that you're needed that you're needing to do while you're doing it. Catherine. Okay, it's gone quiet. I'm going to jump in for a moment if I may. Um, it should be obvious to everybody that in fact how companies are structured varies hugely from company to company. For example, there are plenty of organizations and companies, not just in classical dance, but in contemporary as well, uh, in Europe, where um, you won't ever lay a roll of, roll of vinyl. You won't ever lay a floor because that's a crew job. There are plenty of places where you won't ever make a prop because they're bought in from prop makers or prop buyers. There are plenty of organisations like that. And the other end of the, the, the street, there are plenty where you'll do everything. What your role day by day in rehearsal or in performance, uh, what those days will look like will entirely depend upon the structure of the, of the company you're with at the time. And it can change hugely, 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 hugely. So you could, you know, you, you might for example, get hired to uh, go and work with a, 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 a mid to large scale dance company, of which we have a lot in the UK. I mean, we should be very proud of the fact that we've got something like six international standard dance companies in the UK, possibly seven. I mean, we've got as many international standard symphony orchestras for a population of 62 million. You don't get that elsewhere. So, you know, and, and there's another thought here is that uh, never, never forget that if you are skilled in working with dance in the UK, uh, you are likely to be able to find an opportunity to work overseas as well. However, um, to, to reiterate, it's going to depend upon the specifics of not just the production, but the structure of the company you're with. Um, that, that, that's my comment in that area. Just very quickly, um, knowing that most dance companies um, have a very wide um, and varied, uh, you know, 
cohort of dancers from many, many different countries. So there'll be lots of different languages being spoken within the wings. Um, um, and also knowing that dancers are quite messy and untidy and they wear a lot of tracksuit bottoms, um, leggings, this, that, the other to keep themselves warm. And then they just drop them before they go on stage. So you're continually walking up and down the wings, picking up bits of sort of dancer detritus, as I call it. Yep. Um, and, and just generally tidying up. Um, and, and also they come off stage at speed. Um, so sometimes they can't see when they're coming off stage. So you may need to, as an ASM, this is quite an important job, stand in the wings, lighting your face in order that they know where they're running to. Um, because when they hit a boom, one of those lighting booms, it's not very pretty. Um, but those are just a few other little jobs. I'd just I like, to sorry, Jack. I'm, I'm so, going to say, I see that you bought the naughty box, Zoe. Yeah, I just, thought I, I just thought I'd reiterate uh, that point about, uh, we call them dancer droppings. I think this is probably only a few weeks worth. Um, I mean, I, there's really nice stuff in here. And we, it, it beggars belief. I don't know how they managed to lose so much stuff. But yeah, it's, it's entirely true. It's a um, constant feature of our jobs. <laughs> Brilliant. And then another question that we've got, one from the chat, if we've got time just to do this one quickly, yeah. is are props in ballet more often made or sourced? Um, and what's the sort of funnest prop you might have come across? What was the last part of that question? Sorry, Jack. So it's are props made or sourced um, in ballet? And then sort of what's the funnest prop you've ever come across? Oh, right, OK. Mm -hmm. um so uh, i might have to go away and think about the, the funnest prop but um in terms of made or sourced um i mean it totally depends on production requirements um we we do for, for larger uh, more complicated props makes we do employ external props makers and then it will be the more the more basic things that are made by asm's mm -hmm. company um so, yeah, I mean, like like anything, it just depends on what the, the designer's requirements are, really. Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of areas which almost always should be outsourced, and that would be, for example, weaponry, um, which, which you know, which swords and things feature in a number of the classical pieces. Um, uh, I mean, so if there's a safety aspect that's involved, I think outsourcing has got to be the way to go, unless you happen to employ an armourer or a swordmaster or something like that, which, of course, is extremely rare. In fact, they don't actually have an armour at the Opera House at the moment, I don't think. Um, when I was working with them, we used to get our swords made by the guy at the National Theatre. Yeah. Um, things do break, though. You know, it's 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 a, you're looking at risk control. Another aspect of the daily job is risk control as well, uh, yeah, particularly if you're a big company on tour. Um, local crews, even your own crew, will actually uh, install dancer traps. I don't know how they manage it. You know, you, I mean, typically you've got an off and on on and off stage wing police there'll be a boom or a stand and a shin buster behind it and at some point that shin buster will get moved around about a foot up stage she was right in the way or someone will rig something with a bracket sticking out at head height or even worse a higher one so when 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 you know your principal couple come thundering off at the end of a big classical part of the with 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 the with the guy carry the lady on a full arm arm lift thundering into the wings, blind as bats, you know, the next thing, you know, you've really got to be policing that stage for risk at all times. And, and you get a sixth sense of what's likely to happen. Um, modern day noise boys, sorry, sound departments will, will, will dump rack after rack of gear right on the side of the stage, you know. Um, the, the, the departments, the technical departments can be just as untidy as the dancers. Unfortunately, their stuff tends to have sharp edges, not made out, not be knitted. Um, <clears throat> all right, welcome back everyone. Uh, so we have a couple more questions for you guys, but first of all, we're gonna start off with your question that you had a couple minutes to think about. The, I think it was the strangest prop. Um, Terry, did you wanna start? Um, yeah, and it was a bottle of mineral oil, 
um, and I'll need to explain that. Um, a long time ago, there was a really awful one-act piece, um, the name of which is, is, is sponged from my memory, um, at Northern Dance Theatre or Northern Ballet. <laughs> they were there. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the decor was a whole bunch of little, it, it was a white vinyl floor, white gauze walls on metal frames and lots of large white vinyl covered blocks. The dancers were in all in ones, white, um, you know, the, the, the over, over, over the point shoe type all in ones. Um, and there was an awful lot of posing around and not much, not much that seemed to have any, <laughs> um, any, any relationship to rhythm, music or whatever. Um, it was a right mess. Um, and about halfway through it, a, a, a bodybuilder, you know, someone from a giant gym walked through the middle. The program note said the bodybuilder admires the dancer's flexibility, the dancers admires the, the bodybuilder's musculature. The problem was, is that there was a cue in the, it wasn't a score, because it wasn't, but there was a cue in the like the jobs list or track, I think we call them these days. Um, which was sort of props cue number seven, oil the bodybuilder. <laughs> which you will understand that I did unload on a member of the props staff very quickly. <laughs> so I hope that one qualifies. I think it does. I, I think it does. Uh, Catherine Montague? Um, I think one of my most problematic props um, was a basket of vegetables um, in Giselle, which um, the male called ballet had to bring on. And they um, like to swap things into and out of the basket. Um, so it used to be that I used to, um, and yeah, I can't, they used to put things on leeks and make carrots become, yes, other things that maybe we shouldn't talk about. <laughs> it, became, it became a bit of a sport um, and it got to the point where I, I used to hide the basket uh, and then they, they would bring their own fruit and vegetables that they would put into the basket, which they might have carved or they might have done other things too. But yeah, it was it was sport to what could get in and out of that basket and get on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and also the other thing about dance companies, which I think we haven't really touched on is the fact that they're quite young. Mm. They were all mainly mm. in their twenties. I mean, obviously you have principal dancers who are maybe, maybe a bit older than that, but <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it is a young company and, and, and they like having fun, which is also enjoyable, yeah. <laughs> but can be tricky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, Zoe? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel your pain there, Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, it's particularly, it's, the, it's always the last night of um, a 50 odd show Christmas tour um, I mean, it, the, the brief of um, the, the weirdest prop going on stage, it could be anything that they managed to get past my attention that night. Um, I, I was trying to think about the funnest prop. I think that one of the, the, the funnest briefs we've had here um, was actually one of my first show I did here, which is was um, Highland Fling. It's um, one of Matthew Bourne's early, uh, early pieces uh, that we now do. Um, it's a Les Brotherston design and his his brief for the entire set dressing basically was uh, tart and tat. So um, nothing remotely classy. It was all as tacky and Scottish as possible. So we just got to go and run around all the uh, the um, souvenir shops in Glasgow and Edinburgh and find all really hideous stereotyped Scottish tat. Uh, so that was quite good fun. <laughs> There's a lot of those, too. So there are, there are, yeah, I'm afraid to say, particularly in Edinburgh. <laughs> uh, Catherine Harmer? Oh, why is it always fruit? Why is it always fruit and veg? I had, um, I, we, we did a Cloud Dance Festival at Bernie Grant um, in Tottenham. And we had this piece and the woman came in and tech, the, the, the company came in, they teched it. And they spent the whole tech, there was, number of them and they're all kind of doing this and that could mean anything so we all 
there were no props. She, she brought some props with her, baskets and tables and things. But there, there was an awful lot of this going on. And you think, what the hell are they doing? It could mean anything. So you, okay, bit weird, never mind. Won't query it too much because it's contemporary dance. And sometimes you just don't query things too much because you just don't. And um, then we, they got to the performance and they com- called the company down. They came, in, came down to set, set up on stage. And suddenly there were oranges hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of oranges in baskets in boxes everywhere and stacked up in the wings and um, okay this, is, this isn't good um so they did this dance piece which they were um oranges were brought onto stage in in their boxes and their baskets oranges were handed out to various dancers they juggled with them they did things with them one by one they ended up all over the floor and i was calling the show and couldn't help and i was in hysterics watching all these oranges rolling around the floor of the bernie grant stage and they were going under the into the first row because it's flat to the um, stalls are flat on the first few rows and uh, they were rolling under the chairs to, and people were kicking them back onto the stage. And I can't help because I'm, I'm, I'm calling the show from the corridor with a little monitor. I'm like, okay, ASMs, this is going to be a wonderful scene change. I'm going to enjoy this. I had this um, South African ASM with the driest sense of humour who just appeared on towns going, it will be fantastic. That was that. That was her only comment. But there was the people were absolutely howling on cans because just three of them running around in the dark trying to retrieve oranges from under people's feet. It's always fruit. There's a thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down and note it for later. Uh, on that kind of note. What's the most bizarre thing you've ever had to do as a part of your job? Uh, Catherine Montague, should we start with you? Um, mm, there's quite a few things I probably can't really talk about. Um, but the most bizarre thing, um, bum, 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 bum. we had on um, Garden of Earthly Delights, which is an amazing show. Um, there was a dancer who had to be above the rig and, oh. and literally there were times when she got so hot. So she's hanging, she's literally on a, a high wire fly, um, and she's hanging there and she's up there and she would just sweat. And we used to have to stand underneath her with a bucket. So she would just be in the wings above and then we'd stand with the bucket and the sweat would drip in the bucket rather than on everybody else. That's probably the most bizarre thing I can probably tell you. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not very nice. <laughs> Zoe, I feel like this is all going to be very, these aren't going to be add-on stories. They're going to be all different. So we love it. <laughs> Um, I mean, next week I'm going to be working with two alpacas, so I feel like that's a peak I could be yet to reach. But of, of my career thus far, um, actually going back um, to one of the very early show, shows I did um, in opera as, as an ASM, it was actually it was an evening of uh, five short operas, um, so each about a quarter of an hour long. And um, I think it was on dress rehearsal day the one of the main performers in the second piece raised a religious objection to the content of the third piece he was very upset about I, I, for sensitivity I won't go into any further detail but he was very upset about something that happened in the piece that followed his and they're really we were pretty stuck on solutions at this point it wasn't practical to change the order of the pieces um, it wasn't practical to put an interval between them and the solution that was finally come up with was that as that poor lowly ASM, I was sent on, on stage between the two, two pieces to completely unnecessarily sweep the stage as a symbolic sweeping of one culture into another. <laughs> um, 
the, the, the actual the actuality of this was just, I went on stage. It was, it was a sort of thrust staging with the audience very close to the set. And I could hear them whispering, what on earth is she doing the whole time? Uh, and in fact, um, it's the only time one of my scene changes has ever been mentioned in a review. I made it into the Telegraph. Um, and they weren't, they, they weren't very impressed by me, shall we say. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, I think that's one of the more bizarre things I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, Catherine Harmer? Um, Not dance. I did a theatre show, which is a site-specific show um, for a company I work with regularly. And um, it was at Millet Sonnen, and we created a ghost story show for them, um, which was a promenade, and it started in the bar, and it ended with the audience on the stage. So they got taken around the circuitous route through the theatre, through all the backstage passages and places where they're not normally allowed to go. Um, um, with the general idea that all the way around, there will be various, um, in the middle of all of this terribly convoluted um, ghost story, there would be mention of assorted ghosts and things that are resident at the mill. And, Every now and again, there would be various things that would scare the bejesus out of the audience. So I had various hiding places all over the theatre. Um, and we had corridor, um, past corridor, um, between the bar and uh, another part of like, um, kind of where a wardrobe would be. And it's just a corridor. There's nothing there. And they went, well, you need to be in here because we've got to have these doors swinging wide open randomly in, this, in a scary moment. And you've got to be doing this for another scary moment shortly afterwards. So you've got to be in the room. Okay. So my cast built me a fort out of assorted bits and pieces they found lying around the theatre backstage. They built me a fort. They threw lots of black tat over the top of it. So we just looked like a big, scary, dark thing that you couldn't go anywhere near. So my cue list was filled with sort of go here and hide in here and do this, go there and hide there. And when it got to that, they went, you have to write on your running list, hide in the fort. So I did. It's my favourite cue ever. Hide in fort. That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> yeah. It was a great show. I had, I had other bizarre ones. I had, um, including commando crawl from the entrance of the theatre around the back of the seating to get to a particular point in the auditorium. So where, but I couldn't be seen by anybody at that point. So I'm like, okay, I have to get down on my knees. And Commander Crawl. It's a great show. I love it. Terry? Um, be difficult to match bizarre with the things that have been mentioned already. Um, perhaps alarming is one of the things I've mentioned. Not so much alarming in itself, but alarming at my reaction. Um, Chris Rooney and I were lugging um, uh, New London Ballet around North America probably nearly 50 years ago now uh no 45 um and we were in the uh the Bellas Artes in Mexico City or Mexico um specifically uh with and the, the thing why we were there well we were there as a sort of support band um for Margot Fonten and Heinz Bosel and others um full orchestra the whole kit and caboodle you know um yours truly in at least a dinner jacket and if there was anybody serious in the house full evening dress and I'm not kidding we used actually to wear full evening dress on the side of the stage, the white tie and tails, the full Fred Astaire. Um, and we were doing fine. Uh, uh, the the, the programme started with a piece called uh, uh, Folk Songs, which is a modern style piece with, you know, a, half a dozen dancers and some interesting music. And um, to be followed by the uh, Romeo and Juliet balcony scene, Margot and... Uh, was it? Oh, it was David Wall, actually. Um, fairly routine, um, except that towards the end of it, one of my dancers found his way to near the prompt corner and whispered loudly, there's photographers in the front row. 
this was our first performance in this venue. Um, and indeed, I, my, my, my associate, not assistant, because we shared the job, Chris went, legged it around the back to the opposite wing so he could see in, into the auditorium a bit. And there indeed were about two dozen press photographers complete with flash cameras and everything, waiting for Margot to come on. Now, I've been worked, worked with her quite a lot up to this point, and I knew Demo, there was no way she was going to do anything other than walk straight off. So, down came the curtain for the break between the two pieces, and um, I grabbed an interpreter, my Spanish being really, we're, we're restaurant Spanish, you know, uh, ordering from menu Spanish, and we walked into the middle and explained to the audience that we will continue when the photographers left the auditorium. The, by the way, I mean, I did discover later that the house management had let them in. Now, at this point, also, our producer and promoter, a guy called Gordon Crow, who worked for the Huroc office and was responsible for um, professional boxing and ballet. Now, there's a weird mixture. And was an ex-pro heavyweight himself, turned up on the side of the stage, said, what's happening? I explained to him. And we had that sort of moment of, God, moment, a minute and a half when the photographers refused to leave. And then they made all made a gesture of leaving. Out they trooped. The theatre manager came around and said, what's going on? I said, we'll carry on when they've gone. He said, oh, they've gone now. Right. OK. Hit the button. The orchestra starts. Wonderful long intro. Around about 10 bars in. Slow curtain up, you know. Uh, Margo up on the balcony somewhere on the other side of the stage. Heinz runs on twice around, comes straight off again. Said, Terry, they're still there. Curtain back down again. Um, and we've got another standoff, at which point Gordon decided he'd had enough. Let me explain. Six foot two, heavyweight ex-boxer. Yours truly, a cockney lad brought up in the scruff end of Mitcham. Um, and Chris, who had some time working for the Queen wearing uniform. Um, and so, you know, we thought we'd do something about this. Um, and we went around to find that the photographers were actually in the stage box on our blind side, which, of course, had five members of the audience in it. And so there they were. And basically we started to remove them bit by bit, one by one, not terribly gently. And we had this bizarre situation of 1,500, 2,000 people in the auditorium staring at these three guys in dinner jackets, heaving photographers around. While, and as, you, as we hit one and removed one to throw them out in the corridor, another one would take a photograph. And it was like some vignettes from a, a cartoon. Fabulous. We got the job done. We expelled them. Not gently at all. I'm not suggesting, by the way, to anybody you should do this. Just remember, just look at my smile. It was wonderful. Um, and, um, and, the, and the review the next day wasn't on page three. And the national newspapers, it was a right across the page one. Um, huge headlines saying, Fontaine's bodyguards assault the press. We sold out for the week. <laughs> Fantastic. That's amazing. It's a true story. I've still got the headline. You know. <laughs> yeah. All of you have stories that you're in. I'm kind of speechless. I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, applause from the audience. Um, so next we're going to get into more practicals. So we've spoken about um, properly laying dance floors and having first aid training. What, uh, so another one, what is another practical skill that has been most useful for you throughout your career? And we'll start with Zoe. Um, I think the ability to be decisive, I think it's something I, I always sort of um, say is <laughs> in, in answer to this sort of question to, to, um, to, you know, to students and younger stage managers, I think, the, it was the key thing for me in making the step from being an ASM to being a DSM was learning that um, the wrong decision is often better than making no decision at all. Um, so learn, I suppose it goes with learning to be, think on your feet, be, 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 think quickly, um, not rationally, but quickly. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a leadership skill, be prepared to, to put yourself out there and make that decision. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Herbert. Um, for me, uh, first aid was actually the most useful thing I ever did because as well as um, learning, um, using it 
working on working in dance and working in theatre. If you do the three day first aid first aid at work course, that is also the minimum requirement you you need to work for medical event companies. So all companies who do um, first aid and so on for all the big events, um, festivals, um, Glastonbury, everything. Um, go, you can go work for them. If you find yourself with a gap in your calendar, get on the books of event medical companies. And the minimum requirement is a three day first aid at work, which if you're lucky, you already have. And then you go, hey, employ me. It's another way of getting work. It fills in small gaps throughout the year when you're when you're without work. It's better than not being not having any work. That completely makes sense. Yeah, uh, Terry. I'll pick up on that. Um, having other things you can do between jobs is excellent. So, um, I mean, two I'm always pleased with. I learned to drive a forklift truck when I was a lad, and I learned to weld. Uh, theoretically, I'd never be unemployable, except I'm too old and grey these days. But uh, in terms of a practical skill that you have um, to 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 make life easy for yourself. Um, uh, Decisive was, was was a phrase, I think. Is it, was it Zoe you said decisive? I think that's spot on. Also, um, plausible. Be plausible. Look as if you know what you're doing. Walk around with confidence and a smile. I mean, sooner or later you'll get found out, but hopefully it'll be later. And Catherine Montague? Um, I'm going to go with listening. I think uh, stage management can sometimes walk into a room and talk too much. Um, and actually, if you walk into a room and you listen and you watch and you see, you will learn a lot more about that room and about the people within it um, than if you are just talking. Um, and also, uh, don't forget your body language tell, says an awful lot about you. So when you are standing as stage manager on the stage um, during a tech, um, your body language, your slump, your uh, your whatever, says a lot about you so you know it's it's about what you're portraying all the time um as a person um so yeah uh, i would say listening skills are really really important in stage management all of those are really great thank you um our next question is how has the ballet and dance industry changed over your career and this time we'll start with katherine harmer if that's all right um I do a lot of children's dance shows um, mm. for local companies. Um, and the, certainly the, the biggest thing that's happened, that's changed in the last 20 years or so, um, is the number of boys coming into dance. Um, when I first started, you would have maybe two or three. And it was traditional tap, ballet, modern, that'd be it. And now um, there's, you've got, many many more boys coming in um to dance which is brilliant but also there's a huge variety of dance styles now so your dance um, your local dance schools are teaching street dance and um hip-hop and that sort of thing as well to get those kids in that's probably the biggest thing that i've seen personally yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Uh, Terry? Uh, I suppose the biggest change was at the end of the, uh, the, 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 the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, the, you know, the removal of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Empire, um, which meant immediately there were a large number of, of dance companies um, who were available to work cheap in the West. Um, and by cheap, by God, they looked cheap as well. So, you know, we had some very high standards internationally right the way through the 60s, 70s, 80s. The so time we hit the 90s, we started to see some pretty poor stuff. You'll see them, you'll see companies called, you know, the, uh, the, what, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Imperial Ballet of Samarkand or whatever, who will turn up and they will do six one night stands a week, you know, with a, um, a, a, a terrible bill with a few cloths and some, you know, sort of grab, fortunately not very much lighting because, you know, it'd show up the, the, the kit. Um, 
that's one aspect of things that I don't like. What I do like is the fact that we now have a broader audience than we started with when I was in this game. Um, and the, uh, but that's brought other things which I don't think, I think could be a negative side. The, uh, the days when it was, a, the days when, it, when, it, when the touring company was actually run and managed efficiently and effectively by a small number of people are sadly gone um, in, the, in the funded area. Uh, there are still some commercial outfits who, who manage to sort of just about cope for six or ten weeks a year. But, uh, you know, we, we, there is now a, a plethora of, of added on bodies. Um, and it's a bit like the, you know, the credits at the end of a movie. You see this long list and you think, what do they do? <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, Catherine Montague? Um, I think probably we're now treating dancers or dancers are now being treated more like athletes um, and therefore their nutrition and their well-being and their bodies are um, being looked after and maintained in um, a better way and I I'm sure probably when I worked in dance most of the dancers smoked which I'm hoping I'm looking at Zoe now <laughs> okay they still do a bit um but yeah <laughs> they're hoping that they're not still doing that but obviously they still are but yeah their nutrition and everything else I, I, is much much better uh, and we do have different colored point shoes now yeah which is also a good thing <laughs> that's huge yeah um zoe um so I feel like I, I'm, I feel like a bit of a letdown here because I can't talk about a span that goes back as far as the fall of the Soviet Empire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I'm, 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 you know, in ballet terms, my experience lasts over eight years. But actually, even in that time, there are smaller, though significant changes. Um, I would say, yes, even in the time that I've been working here, I've seen that focus on well-being really increase um and focus on diversity which i think is what you were touching on there catherine really increase um both extremely positive um i think um I, I, again even in my time i do see ballet productions becoming more technical and i think that might answer some of your question terry about what do all those people do <laughs> um, I, I meant the admin side I'm sorry. okay yeah okay <laughs> Um, but yes, I think, you know, we, it's, there's traditionally there's a tendency in ballet to sometimes not have that much on the stage because you need a lot of space to dance in. Um, and I do see, you know, some of our, our productions and our counterparts productions start moving towards some of the technologies that you, you know, you see in the West End, you know, even if we're some way behind. Um, also, just to, in terms of, you know, how we work as a company, um, I've no noticed an increasing reliance on um, using video technology. Um, and it's just something to be aware of if you're coming to work for a, a dance company. Tr so traditionally, um, ballet certainly, uh, ballet companies would um, employ a role called a choreologist. Um, so um, as, a, as a DSM in ballet, you're, you're not expected to get down every single step it's, it's a slightly different focus from you know that the um say say being a dsm in in rep where you you know you really are you need every bit of of, of detail of the actor's movements um there's no realistic um, expectation that you're going to get down or, or even have enough knowledge to get down every detail of the choreography traditionally there has always been this extra role that people train for years in um this role of a choreologist they train in something called Banesh notation which is a particular way of um, notating uh, dance positions and moves on a, a, a musical stave um, even in my eight years here I have seen that start to wane somewhere somewhat that that traditional art I suppose uh, and there is an increased reliance on using video technology to film rehearsals and performances mm. um, uh, and use that as the reference for uh, learning what repertoire when it's revived. Um, and it's it's something um, that as a, a, a ballet or dance stage manager, you might be asked to manage. Um, it, it's a part of my role quite significantly that I've never had to deal with anywhere else. 
Um, so, you know, keeping archives of video, um, processing video, that kind of thing might get thrown at you. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, on the topic of welfare and device diversity too, we've been talking about that a lot in the SM Nest. Um, so that's really interesting to see how it uh, how it's relating in a uh, professional field in so many different uh, productions. So our next question is: What part of the production process would it be most useful to have an extra day? Um, I know this can be a big question, uh, but we'll start with Terry, if that's all right. I, I, I read this question ahead and, you know, I kept thinking of, oh, you know, I would like to have an extra day just to sit in rehearsal and watch it developing. But I was fascinated by the choreographic process anyway. But there's a better one than that. And it's something that you've heard me say this so often, we used to do. And I don't know if it's still viable. Um, it would be lovely to think it was. There was a time when with the larger companies working in classical form, we would have what was known as a general rehearsal. It's not a repetition general in the French sense, but a general rehearsal in studio, in the studio, in the largest studio you could find, where you actually put the orchestra in, but the other way around, with the conductor with his back to the dancers and the orchestra facing the dancers, and the dancers on a mark out in the studio, and you'd go through everything. And what would happen is that you get your choreographer and your ballet master and your light designer all lurking next to the conductor, and you sorted a massive amount of stuff out well before you moved into the theatre. It also meant that, you know, if, if a particular soloist was needing to work at a particular you know, violin solos, you know, oboe solos, uh, cello solos, we've all seen this happen in the, in the classical repertoire. They actually are this one, not this one. They are less than three metres away from each other. Communication is possible. You know, if there's a if there's a problem with Tempe, you can deal with it so fast and so quickly. Sorry about the background noises. The dog wants to go out. That was a thing that we used to do. I don't know if it's done now because I haven't stage managed any dance for at least 15 years, but it would be lovely to think that that is possible. Okay, fine. It's an extra orchestral rehearsal, but the the camaraderie that develops between the performers, the musicians, the creative team, and the stage management team is fantastic. It's instant response, instant cooperation. It's a brilliant situation. Let's bring it back if we have anybody has any influence. Have that style of general. I'll be happy to explain how it's done in detail. Thank you. Um, Catherine Montague? Um, I would probably say that, um, especially in dance, the, the second and third cast don't get as much time, tech time or rehearsal time. And therefore, I always feel like they're, they're always rushed on, on a bit. Um, so having a little bit of extra time for them. Um, so you normally, you know, obviously you're trying to open the show. And then as soon as you've opened your first cast, uh, then you quickly, literally do a cue to cue with maybe your second cast and your third cast. They don't really get um, what they deserve, I feel. <laughs> so that would be my, my bit of extra time. Thank you. Um, Zoe? I think my answer would follow a similar line, really. I mean, the simple answer is just production week. There is, it is never long enough. Um, <laughs> you know, no one ever wants to pay to spend that bit longer in the theatre to, to take the pressure off everyone before you open. But that is, it's a very good point that um, it's, it's a, you know, we, we, for example, our Christmas shows, we sometimes open on a matinee, which means you literally have two casts on on the first day. Um, and even getting those two casts through sufficient rehearsals to, to go on stage safely and com uh, competently is is quite a challenge. So, yeah, an extra day or two or three, an extra week would be lovely at that point, really. <laughs> uh, Catherine Harmer. Uh, for me, um, I think an extra um, an extra day to deal with Alex plot would be mm. perfect. The number of shows that I've done where you actually end up opening a show and you've still got a lighting designer shouting in your ear going, actually, just while you're there, write this number down because 
I haven't made a cue for it yet, but it's going to go there on that word. You know, oh, we've passed that now. <laughs> okay, fine. Scrib making scribbled notes all over your nice little book. And just, just to avoid that, an extra, an extra few hours for LX4 would be wonderful. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, Terry, we just have a question from the chat uh, regarding the conductor. Uh, why did they have their back to the dancers in that last rehearsal? Well, because the, the orchestra is facing the, the okay, mm. what you've got, one half of the building, one half of the room, um, dancers facing towards the orchestra. The orchestra is rotated. I mean, normally, uh, you know, the, the conductor's facing the stage. The point about this is that he can still turn his neck and see, and he's very close, but that's that's why it works, you know. Um, um, I, I, if I had a, I won't bother, I won't bother sketching it, but, you know, it's, it really is a fantastic way. It's about communication. It's about instant fixing. And, um, yeah, well, you know. I love this notion of, 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 of having more time for tech. Um, and for those, you know, there's a movement ahead to make sure that techs don't are quite so exhausting in the future and are better planned. Uh, you will find that under resetbetter.com. Thank you. Um, so, I believe our final question. Sorry, uh, is what is the most unusual production you have worked on? I'm very excited to see to hear these answers. I love questions like these. Uh, can we start with Catherine Montague? Okay, mine was definitely Garden of Earthly Delights, which um, if you've ever seen the painting, um, yeah, it was a live version of the painting on stage. So we had... Um, buckets of rotting potatoes. Um, this was the this was the show which had the four flying dancers. So, and this was the show with the dancer who used to have to spend sort of 15, 20 minutes up above the rig dripping with sweat. Um, they were all in nude body stockings. Um, the musicians were on stage. Um, uh, there was a point where a cello uh, spike was driven into one of the dancers, um, which the musician who had been playing the cello all the way through the piece had to loosen the spike enough to make sure that that happened, which was always my worst moment because I was like, what if they don't do it properly? Um, so yeah, there were lots of things. Um, it was gory, it was disgusting. And the worst thing for me was there was no score and every, literally every bar was a different, you know, different number of beats and it just went on like that um and there yeah four flying dancers one out over the auditorium um so yeah so the arm had to go through underneath the cross so we'd take the iron out put that through bolt it in place and then we'd start the show yeah it was great it was it was an amazing piece but yeah truly by the seat of your pants every night it sounds like it yeah it sounds like it and that was Rombe, it was Martha Clark's and it was Rombe, but obviously Rombe did it, but she'd done it before in America. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, Zoe? I'm going to throw a, a slight curveball and say actually some of the work that we've done in the last year while we actually haven't been able to do performances, um, particularly um, back in October, we made our first ever feature film. Um, so the company felt that there was quite a lot of work going out um, the, of, of the sort of filmed as live type and that they wanted to do something a bit different. So, um, yeah, we made, a, we made a feature film um, of it, it, it mel meshed together elements um, of two of our Christmas productions and then had a, a storyline um, joining it all together involving a, a very sweet young boy who um, discovers a, an abandoned theatre whilst kicking his um, uh, football around a, a lockdown city. Um, so, and that, <laughs> that was one hell of a learning curve. Um, I had to learn to do a very different job very quickly. Um, I, uh, I'm told I, I was doing something roughly similar to a second assistant director, um, where, and my, my team of, we were a team of, of three stage management, which I, I discovered that stage management make no sense whatsoever to, uh, to a film company. 
Um, they they thought we were completely different departments. My my DSM they thought was the sound department. My ASM they thought was a props department on her own. Um, so I was incredibly proud of the end result we made. It, it came out uh, a few days before Christmas and we got lots, loads of lovely comments on social media um, about how it made that weirdy Christmas we all just had feel a little bit cheerier for a lot of people. So very proud of the end product. Not sure I ever want to repeat the process again, but it was, it was certainly an unusual experience and um, at least one to have under the belt. <laughs> So I have two very strange operas that I worked on. Um, I can't actually choose between them because they were both very, very weird. The first one was about a circus pony um, in which every single member of cast dies, um, including a contortionist who gets squished by an elephant. And the other one would be um, an, an opera about a socialist revolution um, in which a capitalist steals all of the money, all of the money from the world stock markets, gives it to his socialist friends so that they can build a better world. They were both entirely barking mad. Terry? Um, gonna go with an unusual venue and the, the thing it brought about rather than unusual production. The production was perfectly straightforward, good old fashioned Swan Lake, but we did it on a temporary platform in the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. Um, we, we couldn't start until after the Sonny Lumiere production that was, has been running there for about a hundred years. Um, um, and so, you know, we, we sort of, I, I had dodgy tents and caravans full of dancers littered around behind bits of pieces of temporary auditorium bleaching and this that and the other and um and a nice big platform covered in marley covered in dance floor you know uh always always lovely you know a couple of follow spots around a bit of a wash here and there not too difficult like live orchestra wonderful i think i can't remember which one it was but whatever it's really good um david taylor conducting i think anyway a long time ago and then Thus the wind started to blow, bringing with it the beginnings of the sandstorm. And so be, be, every now and again, the orchestra would stop. And I and a bunch of, of, of and, and whoever we could get, including some of the dancers, would rapidly whiz across the stage with large brooms to sweep the sand off. Because, you know, kind of, I think they tend to fall off point on sand, you know. So that was it. That was a weird one. Um, we only did the one performance there and the curtain came down around about two in the morning. Could have done without that. Yeah, that's fair. Thank you all so much for your answers. Um